What a joy it is to continue in our worship period this morning. If you'll be turning to 2 Chronicles chapter 34, 2 Chronicles chapter 34, we'll be looking here and gleaning some uh, points from this passage as we're continuing the theme this month of biblical leadership. And we're going to be looking at King Josiah. What a good example of leadership this good man was in 2 Chronicles 34. While you're turning there, I would like to uh, join with Aaron in welcoming everyone here. Um, as our brother Bobby Pender led us in prayer, we uh, invoke God's blessings upon us uh, during the holiday season with people traveling and while that means some of us may be in other places, that also furnishes an occasion for several to be here. Glad to have the uh, FC kids here, young men and young women, and have several other visitors. Um, our son Micah is here. He's out of, out of the vestibule this morning. He's having back trouble, but we're glad that he's here with us. And uh, I was especially glad to see Rick Kaysen. This is his first time to be back with us since his recent hospitalization and illness, so we have so much to be thankful for and so much to pray for. When it comes to Josiah, it would be hard to find someone that has more praise heaped upon him. In Second Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 2, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And not only do you see his personal summation, and, and if you've studied the, the kings, and I know most all of you have, this is not something you read every time when a king is described. You never read it of any of the northern kings. And you seldom read it of the southern kings unless there's qualification. He did right but... But with Josiah, there, there's such wholehearted commendation. He is commended. Last verse of chapter 34, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 33 says, Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord God of their fathers. So again, we're talking about leadership. We're talking about influence for good. And Josiah certainly had that, as, as you see. And so, so we start out by saying that when we select him to be a, a reference for our concept of biblical leadership, uh, the Bible certainly commends him in a special way. In fact, of all the kings of the divided kingdom uh, and, and Judah alone, Hezekiah is the other one. Hezekiah and Josiah are the two that are commended, but especially Josiah. Josiah is commended more than any of the kings of the uh, divided kingdom. So that, that speaks so well of him. And when you think about the biblical context, the world in which he was born, his grandfather was Manasseh. Manasseh reigned for 55 years. And Manasseh was the most evil king that Judah ever had. So much so that with him there was a turning point where God says for the sins of Manasseh, I'm going to destroy Judah. And it was one of those things that might be forestalled, it might be postponed by a good king like Josiah, but it's going to come because of the sins of Manasseh. That's his grandfather, 55 years. And his father's name was Ammon. He just reigned for two years, but he did wickedly. He was sinful. And so here's a young man that comes to the throne, and uh, he is commended in such a good way. I want to tell you that especially makes it worthy of our study because he made a choice to be very different than his family. I'll tell you, family influence is important, but it is not omnipotent. God gives us the ability to choose. And if your family is walking wickedly, you don't have to be like your family. 
you can choose to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. I guess another thing of, of interest about Josiah is that he is a matter of prophecy. I'm, I'm just going to sum it up because I want to talk more about Josiah, but we have to have a little bit of, of, of understanding of the background. We don't want to leave off that when the kingdom first divided, and I know what you're thinking, the year was 931 B.C. Of course, that's right. So when the kingdom first divided, and it's, you were thinking that, weren't you? And in 1 Kings chapter 13, there's a, there's a prophet that goes to Bethel where Jeroboam had set up that shrine with calf worship, Dan and Bethel. But the prophet goes to Bethel and he cries out against the altar. And he said, there's going to be a king that will come, Josiah by name. And he's going to burn the bones of the priest on this altar. He's going to destroy this. That was 931 B.C. I only mention that. Because when Josiah is born and then comes to the throne at the young age of eight, he begins to reign in the year 640 B.C. And so it, it is enumerated what, what he does in seeking the Lord and purging it, Judah and Israel of sin and uh, wholeheartedly seeking the Lord. But this is exactly three centuries. It's 300 years after the prophecy was made. And so we must pause to say that the Word of God is true. The Word of God, whatever God has spoken, so it shall be. It will come to pass just as He has said. And we see that over and over again as the Scriptures say, as Jesus said in John 10 verse 35, the Scripture cannot be broken. And as Paul said in Titus 1 and verse 2, it is impossible for God to lie. And so when we study the prophets, we keep seeing that over and over. And when we study the kings, we're studying the prophets because it's the history of both. But whatever the prophets of God would say, it would come to pass. But when we come to 2 Chronicles, when we come to 2 Chronicles, in chapter 34 and verse 1, the text says, that um, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Now, I, I, I've read this, you know, for decades, but I, it's, it's still a matter of, you know, really, you know, eight years old? You, you think about someone being on the throne at, at the age of eight. Well, of course you know the only way that would work would be that adults that were advisors and in the administration would, of course, of necessity be the ones essentially running the government while he's still in that period of growing up. But that's still when he was on the throne. But what is amazing here, and my first point about him, is in verse 3. And that is in the eighth year of his reign. So he, he begins to, uh, he's on the throne when he's eight years old. In the eighth year of his reign, so approximately age 16. The, the text says in verse 3, while in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young. Would you say 16 is while you're still young? Would you agree with that? So he's, he's 16 years old. While he's still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. Now we'll go ahead and make a couple of other not, uh, notations about this or observe a couple of other things that are noted here. We'll come back to that. But for right now, We'll, we'll just mention briefly uh, something else that said in verse 3, that is in the 12th year, that means 12th year of his reign, he began to purge Judah. He's still a young man because, uh, uh, um, again, you remember he starts, he's on the throne at the age of 8, the 12th year of his reign, so 8 plus 12, he, he's 20. Is 20 still a young age? W would you agree? Well, if you're, if you're real young, you might look at 20 and think that's old, but it's not. So he's, he began to purge Judah. But we're not done in verse in, uh, of its idolatry. And in verse 8, in the 18th year of his reign, now 18 plus 6 of plus 8 would be 26. Well, that's still young. In the 18th year of his reign, he's 26 years old. And this, the, the reason that point is mentioned is because this is when the book of the law was found. And you see what what is pointed out here in more details than is in the account of Kings is that he's already seeking the Lord. He's already 
purging Judah of idolatry before the book was found. But now that the book is found, there's, there's a renewed diligence. There's renewed efforts. He, he increases what he's already been doing in terms of commitment and renewing the covenant and turning the people to the Lord. And this is when that great Passover will be observed. So that's just kind of an overview of what happens. But I want to get back to the first point. That is, Josiah began by seeking the Lord. We're talking this month about effective leadership, about biblical leadership. He began by seeking the Lord. That is such an important concept. At a very young age, he remembered his Creator in the days of his youth. He's seeking God. How old is he? He's 16 here. But the text says he is seeking God. And that's so important. God is going to be found by those who seek Him. He's made Himself available. He wants us to seek Him. And there's nothing better than for a person in his youth to be seeking God. You'll never regret that. I think in terms of Bible examples. Samuel was young when he was seeking the Lord and serving the Lord. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet and he said to the Lord, I'm, I'm just a youth, I'm inadequate. But he was one who was seeking the Lord. Joseph, how did Joseph maintain his integrity? He's a young man, he's age 17, he's ripped away from his father's house and all that was familiar to him and now in a foreign country in Egypt and Potiphar's wife tries to force herself upon him sexually, how does he maintain his integrity? He was seeking the Lord. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? But he's a young man. Daniel was a young man. He was among the youth, taken captive very soon after Josiah's death. Josiah died in 609. And in 605 you have the first of the three Babylonian waves of invasion. And Daniel was among the youths taken captive. And we read in Daniel 1 and verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Daniel was seeking the Lord. David was a young man who was seeking the Lord that God could use so effectively in a leadership position. In the New Testament, Timothy was a young man who was seeking the Lord. And look how God could use him so effectively. I think of people that I've known Back in 1992, I made my first trip to Czechoslovakia with some men that are among the dearest on earth to me. Raymond Harville was one. His daughter Kathy is with us this morning. But Raymond and Bob Waldron, Johnny Felker, and I went to the Czech Republic at first time for all of us for one month of a, for a preaching trip. And... Um, Raymond and Johnny went in one direction. They went east, and Bob and I went south. And in the city where we were, there was a young man who was already there. We were working with him in the area, and it was Lonnie Oldag. Now many of you by now know him. But he was from Nacogdoches, Texas. He was not married, and he was age 20. He was 20 years of age, single. And he was doing the work of, a, you might say, of a much older man. I mean, there are people that are saved today. There are people that are now very strong today and family people today because of the work he was doing back then in 92. As a man age 20 that left home to see what he could do uh, very soon after the Iron Curtain fell and the way was open that, that people could go. I, I think that's something that should not be overlooked. He is a young man coming from a terrible background who's seeking the Lord, and the Lord used him in a powerful way, and God has, stopped, has not stopped looking for people who are looking for him. 
and none of us can even know what potential is in this auditorium right now. You think in terms of you young people that are already seeking the Lord. You've shown that, many of you, by your recent obedience to the gospel. What are you doing when you do that? Are you saying, I just want to be baptized? You're coming to the Lord. You're calling upon Him. You're seeking the Lord. But as, as the text says here, by the way, notice it says, He began to seek the Lord. There, there's a beginning process. And when you begin that and you just continue that, just to think God can do so much for His purpose, for His kingdom, for His glory with you. Don't you want that to happen? Wouldn't you, be like, wouldn't you like to be someone that God can use, again, for His glory, not for our self-promotion, uh, but for the glory of God? And so we learn that. He was seeking the Lord. And a young person who does that, I'm not just talking to young people this morning, but I have to say that about Josiah. But I want to tell you, when a young person does that, he's asking the most important question and coming up with the right answer because he's asking the question, what is life all about? What is the purpose of life? And the answer to what is the purpose of life is, it is seeking God. He had found that the most important thing about life is our relationship with God. And you see, he saw that. He was like when Jesus told Martha, Mary was there, but when he said that Mary has chosen the good part, he says one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And that's what we're talking about, choosing the one thing that is needful. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment was to love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. Matthew 22, verse 37. And so he had found the key to what is the meaning of life. What's the, the, the question, what's the most important thing? Your relationship with God. Loving the Lord with all of your heart. Seeking Him. And oh, we would do so well to follow His, his example. I mean, put it another way. On the other side, most of the problems that we could discuss on, on so many levels, what, what's the reason for that people are not seeking God? When people don't seek God, evil is going to happen. When people are going, not seeking God and just let things run their course, drift along and neglect the things that are right, it's going to be chaos. It's not going to work out well. He began by seeking God. But number two, point number two. Josiah removed what threatened, anything that threatened a relationship with God. Now, I'll take a good bit of time this morning. I'm just going to kind of give it with, by bullet points. I've, I've already said the prophecy was he's going to destroy Bethel. And really places like that, that were idolatrous sites, idolatrous paraphernalia, idolatrous persons. He used fire. He used execution. I mean, he went on a... Well, the word is, is purge in verse 3, the middle of it. He began to purge Judah. Now, it turns out that in the book of Kings, I'm not asking you to turn there right now. I'm just, again, I'm just summarizing. But it enumerates. I mean, it talks about what that means, that, that he purged. He, he, he removed pagan vessels from, from the temple. That's right. There were pagan vessels in the temple. He got rid of all them. And he, de he deposed idolatrous priests, got rid of all them. He pulverized the Asherah image, the, the pole, the, the, uh, the obscene pole. He wrecked the male prostitutes' temples' apartments. That's right, there were male, religious male prostitutes. He desecrated Topheth, the place of child sacrifice. He smashed royal idolatrous altars. He even went to the place that Solomon had, had built idolatrous places. This is in 2 Kings 23. In verse 13, he, he destroyed that, eliminated that. Everything. And not only in Judah, not only Jerusalem and Judah, but he went throughout the northern cities. Even though Israel is not existing as a separate nation, he went into the northern cities and did the same thing. For example, Bethel that I just mentioned was not a city of Judah. 
But he went there and destroyed that and, and burned. He killed priests. He burned bones. He, he did exactly what that, uh, what, what that prophecy said. I mean anything that God had forbidden, everything that was idolatrous, he got rid of fire, execution, removal, smashing, anything. Why, why did he do that? Well, of course, that's what God wanted him to do. But the point of it is, all of that threatens your relationship with God. All of that keeps you from seeking God. All of that was opposed to true worship. And, and so it was wrong for, for all those reasons. Anything and everything that would hinder right relationship with God, he wanted to get rid of it. Is there any application of that to us? If we're seeking the Lord like Josiah did, what do you want to leave in your life that would come between you and God, that would, that would be your idol, that would stand between you and God? I want to ask you this. If you needed to, would you cancel cable, cable TV to get rid of that? If, if that meant you'd have a right relationship with God? If your abuse of the Internet... Uh, would mean that you just should just get rid of the internet. Get rid of that. Would you be willing to do that? Josiah would. Whatever it is that would stand in the way of the Lord. Your, your smartphone. Do you know people have lost their jobs because of inappropriate, sexually inappropriate texting? With, with smartphones, people have lost their jobs and have disgraced their name because of that. Do you, do you realize that? Would, would you be willing to, to get rid of this if, if, if your relationship with God was dependent upon that? You know, for some it might mean a change of jobs would, would be necessary. If that's what it took for you to go to heaven, would you change jobs? What if you had to relocate? Would you... Would you undergo a change of location if that's what it took for you to be right with God? I'll tell you, some decisions look good on the surface. When Lot lifted up his eyes and looked at the plains of the Jordan and saw that they were well watered, as Eden aforetime had been, he said, I want to go that way. It looked good on the surface. But as Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and then you keep reading, and then he's sitting at the gate as one of them. He essentially lost everything. He doesn't gain any wealth when he leaves the city. He loses his wife. He loses his, the betrothed son-in-laws. And you can tell the daughters had been greatly influenced by the society. It was a terrible decision. It looked good. And a lot of things look good, and, and, and you, so you take shortcuts, and you take Compromise, make compromises. And, and then there's the, the bitter fruit that must be a long-term regret that will take place. Josiah removed anything that threatened a right relationship and fellowship with God. I was conducting a meeting. This has been not too long back, but a little while back. And I'd, I remembered it very well, but I'd kind of forgotten this conversation until this lady brought it up. And uh, they were telling about their family and catching me up. And I was, they, they were there for a gospel meeting. And uh, I, they were where I was there for a gospel meeting, therefore having me in, in for a meal. And uh, the, the wife brought up. She said, you know, before I married, you asked me, can you seek first the kingdom? And can you glorify God in this marriage if you go through with that? She said, that incensed me. That made me so mad when you asked me that. Well, she did marry that individual who now is a Christian and is faithful. And he was there present. when He knew about all that. And they said, now we're having that same conversation with our daughter. She's, she's dating someone and... and we're not sure how that, and she, they were laughing about that and said, we're, we're having the same conversation with her. I want to ask you that. 
you're, let's say you're not married. You're dating. You're, you're thinking, you're, you're attracted to this person. You're, you're thinking, is it right for me to ask you, can you glorify God in that marriage? If you marry this person, will, will this help you to seek first the kingdom of God or will that hinder you? Are those not legitimate questions we should be asking ourselves if we're truly seeking the Lord? And if for you to seek first the kingdom of God, that would mean that you not proceed any further, that you not marry this person. Would you be willing to do that for you to be right with God? That's the spirit that Josiah had. You, you see, what I'm talking about is, is looking at our spiritual life and not like, not like this, well, you know, we, we have a life and we also need to be concerned. One of the things we need to be concerned about is our spiritual life. What I'm telling you is our spiritual life is our life. That's the one thing we should be concerned about. That's it. Our spiritual life is our life. And anything that threatens that needs to be removed. Jesus said, if your eye offend you, pluck it out. If your hand offend you, cut it off. If your foot offend, oh, I just have to see her, then pluck your eye out. I just have to walk to her house, cut your foot off. That's what our Lord said. Number three, Josiah was well balanced. He's seeking the Lord, number one. Number two, he removes anything that threatens a relationship with God, fellowship with God. But he's balanced. Let's just suppose, for example, jo Josiah goes through and he smashes all those idols. He burns all this stuff. He puts the false priest to death, which, by the way, was in keeping with the law of Moses. And then he stops there. It's like, it's like when you define sanctification. How do you define the word sanctification? You say, well, it's setting apart. Talk to me more. Sanctification means separation from what is evil. But it's devotion to and pursuit of what is right. Hank, Hank is teaching the book of Leviticus. That's what Leviticus is all about. Holy to the Lord. Learning the difference between the clean and the unclean. Abstaining from anything that defiles. And God used all manner of object lessons about things that might not be right or wrong in and of themselves. But he's using that to teach the principle of being a separate people holy to the Lord. But it's not maintained simply by abstaining from what is wrong. It must be the pursuit of what is right. Going back to uh, 2 Chronicles 34. You, you see at the age of 26, he's involved in, in rebuilding the temple. In, in a positive way, he's, he's restoring true worship. And, and the people already had a covenant with the Lord. But you know what he did was to lead them in renewing their covenant with the Lord. God already entered into a covenant relationship. He had given the people the, the law. Well, let me show you in the latter part of 2 Chronicles 34 what happens. The king sent, gathered all the elders, verse 29, of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the house of God, verse 30, with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites. And then it says, and all the people, great and small. So that means he's got the leadership, but he's got all the people. And the text says, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. And verse 31, Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, to keep his commandments, his statutes, his testimonies with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And he, that is verse 32, Josiah, made all the people who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin Take their stand for it. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of the Lord their God. So God had, had given his covenant at Sinai. God had come down. He had spoken. He had given the, the Ten Commandments, the laws and ordinances. He had spoken to the people. And so Josiah is not implementing a new covenant. But he's reading the words of the law. He's referring to the covenant that God had, had given from which they had strayed. 
And it's a time to renew the covenant. He made a covenant, verse 31, in the sense of renewing the covenant. And don't you like the wording in verse 32? I'm reading from the New King James Version. Where he said he made the people take their stand for it. I mean, there's a lot of difference in saying, uh, this is a Bible. Or I believe that this is God's Word. And going to the level of being in covenant relationship with the Lord. And taking your stand for it. That's what he did. It's, it's a case where they needed to renew their relationship. They needed to renew their covenant with the Lord. I think in terms of how we today have the opportunity in principle to do that very thing. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. When the point was reached where he took the fruit of the vine. In Matthew 26 and verse 28. Here are his words. Jesus said that this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for remission of sins. Now, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we're showing, we're discerning the death of the Lord. But his death was for what purpose? Well, it was, it was, that atonement could be made for our sins, for forgiveness of sins. But he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for remission of sins. By his blood, the new covenant under which we live was procured. His, the covenant was sealed. It was purchased and sealed with the blood of the Lord. Indeed, as Hebrews 9 says, it was the death of him that made it. It was by means of death that he became the mediator of the new covenant. So put away all distractions from your mind as you eat the bread and drink the cup and think in terms, including in your thoughts, that this is a time of covenant renewal. It's, it's the blood of a covenant. We, we eat this feast in the kingdom because we're in relationship with the Lord. We're under His New Testament And isn't that a time that we can discern the body and blood of the Lord, that we can examine ourselves, and that we can silently pray that God would forgive us of anything amiss, and that we renew our commitment to Him. We renew that covenant with Him. And really, our life should be a case of ongoing renewal of that covenant. We've made the covenant. We entered into covenant relationship when we said, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. We repented of our sins, made that confession of our faith, and on that basis, when we were baptized into Christ and raised from that watery grave, we thereby, at that point, entered into covenant relationship with the Lord. But a wise person treasures that and continues to renew that covenant. I would say this about Josiah, and then we'll close. Josiah's leadership and his goodness did not prevent the eventual destruction of the nation. But that doesn't mean he failed. Think about all the joy that Josiah brought. Think about the people that were like him seeking God. Think of the good people that followed his example, the good that he did in his lifetime. And that's all we can do. If if Jesus says of us what he said of Mary in Mark chapter 14 and verse 8, when disciples were criticizing her because of her lavish display of the perfume on that occasion before the Lord's death, Jesus said, let her alone. She has done what she could. She's anointed my body beforehand for burial. And what if the Lord says of us, he has done what he could. She has done what he could. And that's what Josiah did. Josiah is an example of a young person who sought the Lord and was used by the Lord for kingdom purposes, for the glory of God. But as we were saying a while ago, th- there's work for all of us. And we're not just talking about the young people, we're especially doing that with Josiah, but old people, middle-aged people, and the Bible doesn't know about middle age. It's just old people, young people, but we, and, and in our mind maybe we can say all those in between. The lesson's for all of us that God would use us, that we seek Him, and He uses us for His kingdom purposes, for His glory.
trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey as we stand and sing. And we walk with us.